We're going to talk about classification and nomenclature. Um, and again, this is for regular biology, just to cover basic concepts. So classification is simply a system of naming organisms found on the planet in a systematic way based on common features or common characteristics or similarities. Now, right now, we have about 1.8 million species that have been given a name. They're already, we found them, we named them, they're in the log. Um, Two-thirds of these are insects. And the estimate, estimated number of organisms on the planet that we think are around is between 10 to 100 million. So we've got a ways to go. <laughs> um, and on the PowerPoint, you can see just a few of the different types of organisms on the planet. Um, now, who helped us to set up this classification that we're going to talk about? There's two main people in history that helped us out uh, big time, <laughs> and they're worth remembering. The first one is Aristotle. Aristotle lived in 384 to 322 BC. He was a Greek philosopher, and he's often called the father of science. So you should remember Aristotle. Um, and again, he was not a scientist. He was a philosopher. But he, in turn of being a philosopher, became uh, one of our first official scientists. Um, the other one is Carlos Linnaeus. Now, Mr. Linnaeus was a Swedish scientist, and he lived in the 1700s. Both of these men helped to outline, organize, and give us the founding criteria for classification. Uh, between them, we still use that same classification uh, rules now. So, when we classify something, we base it on evidences. And we have four locations that we can get evidences from. Uh, the first of them, is, or the first one, is similarities in body structure, in form. Um, notice in the picture how you have four arms of different critters. You have a human arm, a cat arm, a whale arm, and a bat arm. Now, these arms are color-coded, and the colors, like for instance, um, the first one, the femur, is in a turquoise color. All of these animals have a femur in the same place. And connected to that same femur then becomes the radi radius and ulna. From there you get the carpals, which is your wrist bone, the metacarpals, and the phalanges. Now this order and these bones are present in all of these animals in the same order. That is going to be considered a homologous structure. And those are structures that are similar because of relatedness. Um, now, the other structures that we might see are things like a wing. Uh, insect ha insects have wings, birds, bats. Their wings, if you look at the structures, are not the same anatomically. The, the actual physical setup of them is not the same. And that's because they have similar structures of the wing because of their environment. They're all occupying the air. Um, and so the pressure for them is the environment and that's why they have that structure and so when your structure is due to environmental pressure the same the same environmental pressure versus the same common ancestor it's called an analogous structure um, and again you can see that on the powerpoint know those two terms those are very important the second evidence that we're going to look at is the fossil record and the fossil record will give us clues about how species have changed over time, again, mostly based on anatomy, because um, that's usually what all we can find is bone patterns um, or bone fossils. Occasionally we can find um, things like feathers and hair, but they're harder to come by because of the way fossilization happens. Uh, fossils also give us evidences of species that were living but are no longer living, ones that were extinct. In the PowerPoint, I have a, a plant fossil where a plant got smushed in the marsh and the imprint of the leaf structure and the vein structure was left behind. And we can compare that structure to plants that are alive today and notice similarities and differences. Uh, we can also find spore and pollen sometimes that are compressed in fossils. Uh, we often find insects that were trapped in tree sap. If you ever poke a hole in a tree, uh, usually sap, this yellow amber liquid, will come oozing out. If a small critter, like an insect, gets caught in that, they are preserved forever, or, you know, as far as forever into our timeline, um, as they were, which is really cool and really important for evolutionary biologists. 
Uh, we also see marine critters like the amniocyte, which is a little swirly shell critter. Um, and then even dinosaurs. We have a lot of dinosaur bones. And the most famous is called Archaeopteryx. And Archaeopteryx was the first dinosaur skeleton discovered completely complete in its body. And off the bones, there were imprints of feathers. And before we found this fossil, we thought that dinosaurs were only scale animals, you know, scales like reptiles. Uh, this was the first evidence that dinosaurs may have had feathers, which makes sense because when we look at the DNA, um, we see that reptiles and birds are closely related. So Archaeopteryx is really important. Um, another fossil we can find are footprints. Um, and the footprints, if they're complete enough, we can actually follow the footsteps of an extinct animal and see a little glimpse into its life. Now here in the cartoon you see footprints of two distinct species. Uh, one fairly big, one smaller. And you see how they intersect. It looks like they dance around and then one species walks off and the other one disappears. So you can have two guesses about what happened there. Either the animal that walked away ate the first animal or the animal that um, walked away lost that animal that was tussling with because it flew away. We're not sure, but we can take pretty educated guesses based on fossil footprints. And the really cool thing is if you go to Moab, Utah, here in the United States, there are areas where fossil um, beds are still preserved, old marshes that are now solid and, and hard. And in the PowerPoint, you can see an actual boardwalk from Moab that I went to last year. Um, and then you can see two footprints in the picture. One looks like a, a large plate indentation, and that was from a sauropod, which looks a lot like what we think of as Brachiosaurus, the long neck dinosaurs. And above it, there's a three-toed imprint, and that one is from a theropod, um, which is a kind of, kind of looks like a velociraptor, but not quite. Um, and you can see those images there. And so these are, are there in Moab right now for you to go and see. You can actually go and look at a fossil, which is really cool. Um, and so if you have a chance, go to Moab. Cool place. Now, back to the evidences. Uh, the third one is genetic makeup. So we look at, with our new technology, we can look at DNA. And we can see how close one critter's DNA is to another and then assign it like a percentage of closeness, of similarity. Um, so we look at the DNA pattern and also the proteins that those patterns create. And as our DNA uh, knowledge gets wider, we'll be able to say with more certainty relatedness. That's still in the works. Uh, there's a little graph here that talks about similarities of humans to other critters. Uh, we're most similar to chimpanzees and we're least similar to a what's called a lamprey, um, which isn't, it's an aquatic animal, almost a fish. Um, lizards, we're sort of in the middle, we're about 57% the same, and you can see the others. And the final evidence that we're going to use is called embryology. Uh, now this is the study of embryos and their development. In the picture you can see there's several different embryos at the top row. Now they all kind of the same. They're a little bit different, but you can't really tell which is a human, which is a fish, which is a whatever. If you look at the second row, which is a little bit farther on in time of their development, you start seeing some differences. But again, it's tough to tell for me and most of my students um, which is the human, which is a fish, which is a, a cat, and so on. It's not until much later in the development of the embryo that you can see very specific differences. And you finally see that the first critter is a fish, the second one is a salamander, turtle, bird, pig, cat, can't read that one, and then a human. Um, so that lends itself to evidence that all of these creatures have some common ancestor relatively close in the past. Um, and so a combination of all four of these evidences are used to decide how similar or different organisms are from each other evolutionarily. Um, and again, the more of those four that you can combine, the more strong your conclusion is. Um, and often scientists don't use just one, they use all if possible. Okay, so how do we classify? You know, we're grouping things together, how do we do it? 
So again, we base it on similarities in all of those four things. Similarities in structure, in fossils, in DNA, and in embryology. Now, when you classify, there's this nice reverse pyramid. It's a pyramid, but it's upside down. And it's upside down because the first grouping, this whole thing is just about groups. The first group is very broad, very general. And as you go through the classification, it gets very narrow until you're alone within your own species. And it goes from domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. And you need to remember that order uh, for the exam and just in general. To help you remember, there's a mnemonic sentence and it says, Dear King Philip came over for great soup. Now, the first letter of each of those words will give you the first letter of the grouping. So, dear for domain, king, uh, king for kingdom, uh, Philip for phylum, and so forth. Now, each of these groupings tell you something about the organism. So, if we look at humans, we are in the eukaryotes, which means we're, we're made of complex cells that interact and work together. We're in the kingdom animalia because we're animals. We're in the phylum chordata because we have a spinal cord and a post-anal tail. Now, our post-anal tail is uh, your tailbone, which curves under um, just past your, your anus. Uh, and if you break it, you'll know it'll hurt a lot. We're mammals because we have hair and mammary glands. Um, and both male and females have mammary glands. In fact, if a male is injected with hormone, with the hormone estrogen, he will develop breasts that can give milk. Um, it's just a matter of hormones that determine male versus female in, in humans. Our order is primates, which means we have opposable thumbs. And our family is hominid, which means we don't actually have a tail that shows, and we have developed forearms. Our genus is Homo, which means we have a large brain, and we show the ability to, to make and use tools. And then our species, or specific epithet, is sapiens, and that's just the assignment we've given ourselves. So again, each one of these levels tells you something important about the species, about, in this case, us, or if you're looking at a lion, about the lion. So it, it's all very important, but it won't make sense unless you look at what each of those groupings mean. Okay, and so how do we name this stuff? Got the classification. How do we give things a name? Well, we give every organism that we find, study, and name has two names um, to make up the whole. It's kind of like your first and last name. And it's called binomial, bi means two, nomial means name, uh, nomenclature. It's a system of giving names. Always, always these names are in Latin. And we do that because one, Latin's a dead language. So it's not going to change, it's not going to have new rules suddenly pop up. And also, since Latin is a dead language and no one uses it, everybody who learns it has to start from zero. So we're all in the same equal playing field. Uh, so your genus is the first part of your name, going back to that triangle, um, and it's always written with the first letter capitalized. So in our case, it's homo. Our specific epithet is the last part of the triangle, that little bottom part, and it is going to be all lowercase letters. Together, these two words must always either be italicized or underlined, and that's just a formatting rule. Uh, cool thing about the genus, the first part of the name, if you share the same genus with any other organism, it means that you are very, very, very closely re related. And we see that with um, huh, the kitty cat, or Felis domesticus, um, the tiger, Felis tigris, and the lion, Felis leo. Now these are all very different organisms, but they all share a very close common ancestor, and we know that because their genus is all felis. So again, relatedness is closeness, and you can determine relatedness by the genus. Um, you will be choosing your favorite animal and classifying it for me in class. A really good website that I recommend is Animal Diversity Website, ADW. And they have most of the animals that you, you would be interested or commonly want to look at. Um, if you look in the right-hand side of the screen, kind of toward the bottom, click on classification, it'll give you everything you need. Hope this helps. We'll be working with this. And yeah, have a good afternoon.